بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يا مشايخ أهلا وسهلا ومرحبا بكم to our book reading حلقة إن شاء الله جيد we hope that uh, you can all hear us clearly now we hope uh, all is well in Allah. the book that we will be covering is titled the responsibilities of the ulama and this was a lecture delivered by mufti muhammad rafi uthmani who is the elder brother of mufti taqi uthmani and he is the principal of dal ulum karachi and the father mashallah was also a great scholar of the indian subcontinent this was a lecture that he delivered at dal ulum dal ulum azadville here in south africa and this was on the 6th of rajab the year 1426 which equals uh, and coincides with august 2005 walhamdulillah uh, this lecture here at the end of it, he gives a summary of the entire lecture. And that's good. It's a good thing to do. That when you begin a talk, to explain to the people what you are going to talk about. Then you speak whatever you wanted to speak. And then at the end, you summarize whatever you said. Jahid. And so people will remember bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. So mashallah, alhamdulillah, you say to the brothers, the sisters, etc. We are here to discuss X, Y, and Z. I will be dividing my talk into three uh, uh, three sections, section one, two, and three. And then when you come to the end of your talk, you say, in summary, brothers and sisters, this is what we discussed, alhamdulillah. This will ensure that whatever you had mentioned is fresh in the minds of the people, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. So let us begin the introduction on page number five. Respected and honorable ulama. Indeed, I find myself incapable of fulfilling the enormous task which I have burdened, been burdened with, that is to address these noble ulama and scholars. Because for a student like me to speak in front of the ulama is like putting a lantern in front of the sun. This is from his tawabu, this is from his humility. The scholar, the alim, must be somebody who is humble, jayir. Very often the scholar, because he's got knowledge, mashallah, he, he, has, he has the sense of arrogance. He feels that he is smarter than everybody else, etc., etc., right? And so this is his talk, he's discussing, and he's talking about the responsibilities of the ulama. And as I mentioned, at the end of the book, he gives a summary, and he says, number one, that uh, we must not suffice ourselves with surface level knowledge. We must go deep into knowledge, right? You have a well which is uh, for five meters, 10 meters deep. Uh, sometimes the water might dry up. But if you have a borehole which is dug deep, drilled up to maybe 80 meters in the ground, mashallah, you're going to have enough of water there, alhamdulillah. So the deeper it is, the better. Some people, they study in the Dar Ulum, the Jami'ah, etc., etc. And then khalas, they don't open up their books again. They think that they know everything, Jayid. Every day you are supposed to be studying. Every day you're supposed to increase in your knowledge. As has been said, if your yesterday and today are equal when it comes to knowledge, then you've wasted your time. You're wasting your time. Allahu Musta'an, Jayid. So it says, number one, great and continuous effort is required uh, to create depth in one's knowledge. We must not be content with whatever we already know. Number two, he says the fiqh of batin uh, should be given the same importance as the fiqh of zahir. Batin that which is inside and zahir that which is apparent. So the knowledge of the inside and the matters of the internal must also be given importance like the zahir. And then he says that uh, it should be borne in mind that one is supposed to practice upon this knowledge. A tree without fruits, fafi faida, jay. We're supposed to practice upon this knowledge. And he says, for this, you should keep the company of the pious and the followers of the sunnah. Number three, he states that when uh, there's differences of opinion, when they arise between the ulama and the du'at, organizations, etc., etc., then we must be moderate in our response and we must follow the quran and the sunnah with regards to these matters because we will differ 100 percent, we will differ but now how are we going to differ that's the question inshallah so number one continue seeking knowledge and be deep in your knowledge not just surface level knowledge number two don't forget your inside Jaid, you learn about oppression you learn about justice you learn about smiling you learn about being a good person you learn about the hajjud salah you learn about all of this here but where's your amal where's your amal with regards to these matters and then the matter of difference of opinion so he says now they want him to speak in front of all of these scholars this is like putting a lantern in front of the sun because you don't need 
You don't need a lighter. You don't need a torch in front of the sun, right? Now, obviously, he is saying this out of his tawadu and out of his humility, inshallah, right? And then he says, I can still picture the scene of this country, South Africa, approximately 49 years ago. A scene which has been regularly flashing through my mind since I landed here eight days ago. So he visited in 2005. And also before that, he had visited 49 years before that, subhanAllah, trade. Uh, and he says, what was the, you know, what was the environment like when he first visited in 1966? In 1966, I accompanied my illustrious father, the author of Ma'arif al-Quran, uh, Mufti Muhammad Shafi, uh, Shafi, on his visit to South Africa. Most probably, they will be in this uh, gathering only a handful of people who had seen that time. Ulama and Kufas were very hard to find at that time. For what I can recall, there was Molana Suleiman Sahib in Middleburg, Molana Ibrahim Mia, and Mufti Sanjalvi Saab at Mia's farm, and Molana Abdul Haq Umarji, and uh, Molana Abdurrahman Ansari in Durban. Kufas were very few, and the quality of reading was extremely poor. In the masjid in which uh, we were residing, the Imam couldn't even recite Surah Al Fatiha. The verse, غير المغضوب عليهم والضالين, instead of bod, he would recite it with a dal. None were familiar with the effort of tabliq at that time. In fact, the word of the work of tabliq had not even begun here in South Africa. Haji Bai of Durban would attend practically every program of my father while we were in Durban. He was uh, at that time very young. Yet I would notice him crying in abundance. He would complain to my father saying, in this country of kufr, fisk and fujur, how will we be able to protect our iman and the iman of our progeny? SubhanAllah, Jayid. So uh, this person, Haji, Haji uh, Baipadia, he was the person who like initiated and started the work of the belief in South Africa, Jayid. And uh, so the author is saying, when they visited here in 1966, this youngster, Haji Baipadia, he was there, he would attend. And look, from the time he was young, he had this fikr that uh, uh, we're living in this country of South Africa, we don't have ulama, people can't even recite the noble Quran, even the Imam of the Masjid couldn't even recite Surah Al Fatiha. How are we going to protect our, our own Iman and the Iman of our children in this country of Fisk and Fujur? SubhanAllah, Jayid. Look at the fikr that he had. Look at the thinking that he had, subhanAllah. Are we thinking about ourselves, our iman, the iman of our children, iman of our grandchildren? And subhanAllah, this man, by Padia, so he started the effort of Jamaat al tabliq in South Africa. And you know that how many people are involved in Jamaat al tabliq in South Africa and in Southern Africa and stuff like this, Jayid. Imagine how much of a reward this man will get. How much of thawab will be on his scales when he started this effort here, subhanAllah, Jayid. But solely with the grace of Allah, in this environment of sin and evil, a series of visits by great ulama was initiated, which began with the principle of Dar ulum Dioband, Maulana Muhammad Qari, uh, Muhammad Tayyib Sab, followed shortly thereafter by my illustrious father and other ulama. Advice of senior ulama to South African Muslims. Indeed, in the words, in the words of the pious, uh, are immense blessings. In every lecture, my father would emphasize the need to be concerned with the iman of one's children. All those of you, ya Mashaikh, you are teaching children, you have a great responsibility, great amana upon your shoulders. My father would offer advice on what needed to be done for this purpose. What a deplorable state that was. And now, today, through the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how the situation has changed when he came in 2005. The advice of the elders, including my father, was that whoever is blessed with many children should sacrifice at least one of them to travel to India or Pakistan to become an alim. My father would emphasize that just as the father sets aside a portion of his wealth for those children who work in his business, he should similarly set aside an amount for the son who is becoming the alim so that he could have something to fall back upon. Fruits of the advice of the, of the ulama. Praise be to Allah that to a great extent these advices were accepted and practiced upon, the result of which today presently we are seeing in South Africa, 2005. Not only has a great number of ulama emerged, but Darul Ulums have been produced uh, as well. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established, for example, this huge Daru Ulum in Azanbil, from which many students graduate annually. You have uh, most probably heard on the radio or read in the newspaper, admission for foreign students in the Daru Ulums of India and Pakistan has become very, very difficult nowadays. And thus Allah has created an avenue here in South Africa and in England to fulfill the need of the world. Those who want to go and study in India and Pakistan, difficult, right? Visas, etc. So, Alhamdulillah, in 2005, he's saying at least the students can come to South Africa and study here. May Allah protect these madrasas from all evil, remove all difficulties, and help in it in every step of the way. I mean, I am merely a student, and Alhamdulillah, in the company of my elders, I have learned that a student should always remain a student. Even though one begins lecturing, teaching, writing, even issuing fatawa, one will always remain a student. The famous statement is, You should seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. Take note, he didn't say it's a hadith, because it's not a hadith. Right? Seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave is not a hadith, but it's a good statement. It's a wise statement. These fundamental duties, three fundamental duties of a student. Alhamdulillah, I am a student. And my dua is that Allah always keeps me as a student. SubhanAllah, Jayid. Great scholar, I say, I'm a student, mashallah, Jayid. We are all well aware that every student has three duties. The first being tikrar, tikrar, tikrar. Jayid, idha takarrar, takarrar. Jayid, when you revise, revise, you must revise, Jayid, revision, mutala'a, Jayid. So, the first one is tikrar, revision. Day after mutala'a, preparation for the following day. And finally, regular attendance. Mawlana Ashraf Ali Tanbi and all our elders would place great emphasis on these three matters. Revision, revision, revision. Preparation, 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 and you must attend. Our teachers continuously emphasize its importance, and we do the same with our students. As far as possible, do not let one lesson be missed. Lessons should only be missed due to those reasons which permit the leaving out of salah with jama'ah. Rain, hail, I'm very sick. Only the reasons that apply when you don't have to go to the masjid for jama'ah, only if those reasons are there, only then can you uh, can you leave a lesson out. Yeah, Mashaikh, you know that sometimes, I mean, the rule is you must never ever be shy to ask a question. Shifa ul'i as sual. The cure for ignorance is to ask. So even if it's a simple question, if you've got doubt, you must ask. But having said that, I can also tell you running the IDP now for like eight years, sometimes Imams ask us questions which are basic questions, Jayid, which they 100% should have known, especially if they went to a Darul Ulum and they studied. Where's the halal? There's a mushkila somewhere. Where's the mushkila? Was that Imam not in class? Was he absent? Was he not studying? Was he not reading? Was he playing fools? But now he's the Imam of a masjid. The whole community is looking to him for answers, etc. Jayid, so pull up your socks. As far as possible, don't let a single lesson be, be missed out. While in class, pay full attention uh, to the lesson. Allow me to mention one more point on this matter. Seeing that in this, this gathering is an informal gathering of ulama and students, I'm not going to force myself to keep the lecture in sequence. At times, you remember some beneficial points, so I will mention it to you. We were discussing mutala'a, tikrar, and regular attendance. Once uh, Mulana Ashraf Ali Tanbi explained a unique method of making mutala'a, and that solved a major problem of ours. While we were studying, we would have approximately six or more lessons every day. At night, we would do our revision and preparation. At times, we would come across difficult sections. We would thus turn to the hashia, the notes, uh, and it was not sufficient. Uh, then we would open up the shuruh, the books of shuruh, the explanations. One kitab would barely be completed, and then it would be 11 o'clock in the night. Uh, with uh, difficulty, we would manage another one or two kitams, but uh, many kitams would get left out. This would cause great distress to us, since our teachers would regularly emphasize the, the need for mutala'a, whereas we were unable to fulfill its due or right. So a unique method, Mulan Ashraf Ali Tanmi had explained, 
Mutala does not mean that one should make extensive research by going through the side notes and commentaries. Rather, Mutala only requires one to separate the ma'lumat from the majhulat. That you must uh, separate between the known matters from the unknown matters. For Mutala'a, you should have a brief overview of the matter. One needs to only browse over the text which will be taught the next day. Certain lines will be understood and certain will not be understood. Those places which will not be understood uh, must be kept at the back of one's mind. Thereafter, the kitab should be closed and another which should be opened. In this manner, mutala'a for every kitab will be possible. Thereafter, one will attend the lesson and in the lesson, one will listen to the explanation of the ustad and then one will learn matters and then if still one doesn't understand then one can ask the ustad and then the matter will be made clear to the student inshallah whoever whichever student practices upon these three aspects regularly will not find any difficulty in the exams etc etc one ashraf ali tanbi would say i myself would never find any strain during the exams because i would do this daily revision preparation and attending the lessons anyway i was saying that i'm only a student while we were studying, alhamdulillah, we used to be very punctual with our revision and our habit of uh, repetition and studying and preparation. Thus, I now intend making tikrar with you of the lessons we learned from our pious elders, what we witnessed from their actions and what we heard from their lips. For a student, instead of lecturing, tikrar is more appropriate and suitable for his rank. There are many points which I would like to mention, but time is limited. I will have to select a few points. Right? So he says, number one, Ulama need to make effort and they need to pay attention to number one. An effort needs to be made to acquire ilmi tabahur, to go deep into knowledge, tabahur, into the oceans of knowledge, depth of our knowledge. It's essential that our desire and effort for the acquisition of knowledge must never ever come to an end. Our desire must always increase for knowledge. We should never be satisfied with what we already have learned. Number two, we should uh, uh, also worry about the internal, our spiritual condition, right? our rectification. And number three, we must learn how to deal with differences of opinion when they arise amongst the ulama. He starts then, goes into details with regards to, with regards to number one. He says, with ilmi tabahur, you require extensive mutala'a and research and looking into books and reading. Uh, he says that my father used to say it causes me great grief to see that there is great need in matters where uh, we require people to study more. Jayid, while satiation is found in areas where hunger and desire are essential, in worldly matters, contentment is desired. But in religious matters, greed is required. Uh, look at that, mashallah. When it comes to the dunya, you must be content. But when it comes to deen, you must be greedy. I'm greedy. I want more. I want more. Try it. Unfortunately, we find that matters are now upside down today. My father used to say, in my opinion, only the person is worthy of being called an alim of deen whose mind is always occupied with some mas'ala or some mas'ala. Subhanallah. Try it. This word should be written with gold. It says that his father used to say, that the person who deserves to be called an alim is the one who his mind is busy with masail. Jahid. Incident of Mulana Anwar Shah Kashmiri. The incident of the pious people of the past is amazing. Our father used to regularly narrate to us a certain incidents uh, regarding Mulana Anwar Shah Kashmiri. My father narrated that uh, the following incident that uh, once uh, Mulana Shah Anwar Shah Kashmiri he wrote the explanation of Sahih al-Bukhari, Fayd al-Bari, was extremely ill, right? And uh, this illness, he eventually passed away due to this illness. Once uh, late at night, the news reached uh, Duban that uh, Mulana had passed away. Uh, Sheikh al-Islam, Shabir Ahmed Uthmani, the father of uh, Mufti Taqi Uthmani, upon being informed, left his dwelling to go and confirm the news. Hazrat Shah Sahib's house was on the outskirts of the town in Mahalla Khanka. As he approached the house, he noticed the lantern burning in the room. This increased his fears. Since there was no other apparent reason to keep a lantern burning till so late, he knocked on the door and after making salam, he requested permission to enter. And Shah Sahib called him in. 
and he said, upon entering, I found that uh, the book uh, Shami, uh, the book of Hanafi Fiqh was in his hand and he was sitting in the Shahrud posture in front of a light and he was busy reading. So he thought that the Sheikh passed away, but when he came to his room, he was busy reading. I asked him about his health and he said that uh, they have to pose the following question. What mas'ala could be so important in your state right now that you are so sick, but you are here in the middle of the night and you are using a lantern and you are busy researching. Even if there's some problem, I'm surprised that its answer could have slipped your mind. Do you need to open the book and go and do all of this late at night, etc.? And Allama Uthmani said this as Hazrat memory was very phenomenal. After reading a book, he would hardly forget it. To explain this point, let me first narrate an incident regarding his memory. Thereafter, I will complete this incident of his illness. Right. Uh, so he's talking now about Anwar Shah Kashmiri's memory. We had heard many incidents of his memory from our father. Uh, one was regarding his lessons of Tirmidhi or Bukhari. He would deliver his lessons in Urdu and my father would note it down in Arabic. During one of the lessons, a student posed a question regarding a matter uh, which in reality had no relationship with the hadith under discussion. Shah Sab replied, Allama ibn Humam had given an answer in his Fathul Qadir. He thereafter began reading out the text of Fathul Qadir in Arabic, which was approximately half a page. My father said we were left amazed and even forgot writing. We noticed, uh, Hazrat noticed our astonishment and said, said you ignorant ones, right? He, he said you, you must be speaking to his students, you jahil ones. Do you think that I read this recently? In fact, I read it many years ago. I had undertaken a journey to Lucknow. When I was traveling to Lucknow many, many, many years ago, I read this. Since I was going to stay for only a short while, I had not taken any kitab along. However, I got delayed and was forced to stay for about eight days. I asked the host if they had any kitabs and he directed me to the bookshelf in one room with some old books which belonged to his grandfather. And there I found Fatul Qadir. During my stay in his house, I read all six volumes and I never looked at it again. Subhanallah, Jaid. I've got Fatul Qadir. Jaid Fatul Qadir in this side. Shaykh Jaid Fatul Qadir. So, talking about the memory of Anwar Shah Kashmiri. In the middle of the dar, somebody asked a question and so he remembered something there from Fathul Qadir. And he began like quoting about half a page. And then his students are amazed, MashaAllah, you jahils. It's not like I read this thing yesterday or today. I read this years ago when I traveled to Lucknow. I stayed in somebody's house. He had the book there. And in eight days, I read the whole six volumes. SubhanAllah, 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 SubhanAllah. Jaheed ya mashaykh. Alama Zaylari's Kitab Nasbur Raya is famous amongst the ulama, filled with treasures of ahadith. Alama Ibn Humam based his book Fatul Qadir on uh, the ahadith recorded in this book, followed by ijtihadi discussions. Hazrat Sam once uh, spoke regarding these two kitabs. He said, All the ahadith which Ibn Humam mentions in Fatul Qadir has been taken from Nasbur Raya except three. Only that person could ever make such a remark could be somebody who like knew or memorized all these kitabs. And this was the memory of Anwar Shah Kashmiri. Now to continue with the incident, you remember when he came to the house and uh, Anwar Shah Kashmiri was like uh, sitting with the lantern there and he was very sick. So he continues with that story. So I asked him, what can be so important middle of the night now you are opening up all these books and you're so sick, etc., etc." Jaid, and so then he says, uh, he remained quiet for a while and then he lifted his face and he said, Bye, this is also a sickness. Hazrat at that time was not researching due to some urgent matter, rather, he could not survive without his books. So, what he's saying, he's saying, This is my desire, my greed to be reading, etc., etc. This is also a sickness, a sickness that I have. I've got the sickness that I want to continue reading, etc., etc. So he couldn't survive without his books. Jain, mashallah, many of you have received many books recently, ya mashayikh. Jain, read those books, study those books, teach those books. It's better to read one book three times than to read three books. Alhamdulillah, we also found our father with this very same spirit. He would never find, we would never find him unoccupied. Of course, he would take our time for sleep, eating, etc., obviously, but I'm referring to futile actions. He would not be busy with nonsense, right? 
my father mentioned once that he decided to pledge allegiance to Mulana Ashraf Ali Tanvi and he posed the following question Hazrat, I intend pledging allegiance to you, but I have uh, heard that in this great uh, effort uh, and sacrifice is required. Unfortunately, I find myself extremely weak to endure such difficulties and neither do I find the time required for such tasks. Majority of my time is taken up by the preparation of lessons that I deliver at Darul Ulum Dioban. And in this condition of mind, can I still derive benefit uh, from Suluk, etc.? Mulana Ashraf Ali Tanbi was, of course, the Hakim. Uh, he was given the title Hakim Al Ummah. Uh, he said, We are not cracks, meaning unqualified people who don't have knowledge. We give the same medication for every ill. We are not like cracks who give the same medication for all the, for all the same uh, all the different illnesses <clears throat> i shall prescribe such a method for you which will save you both time and energy and at the same time you shall be able to traverse all the roads of suluk there are only two things besides your obligatory duties i need you to do obviously your faraid you must do it if later you find a little time for tasbih i shall then advise you advise you with some However, this shall only be encouraged, not demanded. The two things I need you to do are number one, live with taqwa and abstain from futile actions. Abstain from those matters which do not benefit. Again, two, two advices. Jay, you want to be a big Sufi? You want to be a big Sufi? Do these two things here. Live with taqwa and stay away from futile matters. Stay away from things which waste your time. My father used to say, that uh, we did not put us through any difficulty, nor did he demand from us great sacrifice, nor were we exerted through spiritual exercises. All we had to do was abide by these two requirements, and thus we traversed the path and the road of Suluk. A removal of a misconception. In Pakistan, I am confronted many a time by some youngsters who are pious in appearance and come from good homes. They appear intelligent and educated. They approach me, uh, for example, with the following request. Hazrat, I'm st studying at a medical college and through the grace of Allah, uh, I was inspired and uh, uh, I want to now join your Daru Ulo. And uh, so when I ask them, why they made such a decision, why they want to leave medicine and study at the Dar Ulum. They say, Azrat, up till now we were involved in the dunya and now we want to turn ourselves towards the deen. People feel, so the Mufti is saying here, yeah, people feel that the path to Jannah are only restricted to two or three a'mal. Either you join the Dar Ulum or you go out in tabligh or you go and do jihad. That's all, khalas. That's what people think. Jannah, they think that Jannah will only be attained by choosing one of these three paths. No, that is not the case. This is what people think, whereas our Prophet ﷺ has taught us uh, that uh, there are many avenues, Jayid. Roads to Allah are numerous. What our elders have taught us is that just as how one shall be able to find Allah through the above three ways, similarly, it's possible for one to find Allah through other avenues, example, through business, through occupation, through politics, etc., etc. Khulafa al Rashidin, they found Allah's pleasure in governing with justice. Some of them found it in teaching and learning, some found it in tabligh, some found it in jihad, some found it in business, etc., etc. Right? The need for secular knowledge in an Islamic society. In an Islamic society, there's also need for doctors and engineers and scientists and experts in medical modern technology. In uh, the light of uh, the Sharia, the acquisition of such knowledge is also far kifaya. Such numbers of Muslims should attain expertise in these fields <coughs> whereby the needs of the Muslim Ummah may be fulfilled, leaving us independent of others. In short, the learning of these sciences with the intention of serving Islam is also necessary, rewarding, and it is a part and parcel of deen, and one might attain Jannah via it. Two conditions must be fulfilled. The intention must be correct and you must be sincere to have the needy uh, to earn halal risk and to be a service to the Muslims. Number two, the method must be correct. Studying, one must ensure that all forms of sin, etc. are avoided. The purpose of studying should not be to make money and just become rich without any concern of what is permissible and what is not permissible. Thus classes wherein there's mixing of men and women and boys and girls, etc. must not be attended and the harms of such places are too many. How many cases have we not heard about people uh, where these uh, things occurred and eventually uh, 
sometimes the girls run away with non-Muslim boys, etc., etc. He then continues. To be aware of current affairs is also the responsibility of the ulama. To attain depth in one's knowledge and to never be satisfied with what one already knows is the first duty of the ulama. The reason for this is that the world is undergoing a rapid change. In the last 25 to 30 years, such changes have occurred in the world uh, that just keep uh, and that just keeping up with it becomes difficult. Even then, the ulama are required as far as possible to keep in touch with current affairs, ponder over it, and extract remedies and answers. The ahadith of the Rasul are explicit on this matter, and so too the practice of our elders. They would devote their efforts in, uh, and time in discussing, pondering, extracting solutions for current problems. While doing takhassus, specializing in fiqh, we, will, uh, we would hear our honorable father many a time saying, it is, uh, it is famous amongst the fuqaha that man lam ya'rif ahla zamanihi fahuwa jahil. The person who doesn't know the people of his age, then he is ignorant. Such a person is not entitled to be an alim. As he is unaware of the conditions and the maladies of the ummah, how can he be able to treat them if he doesn't even know the sicknesses and the illnesses? Such uh, as keeping one's knowledge fresh and up to date with current issues is of utmost importance. One should also keep in touch with other ulama involved in such research and wherever possible of one's assistance to them. Uh, the need for depth in knowledge is the first area of concern. Then he moves on to the matter of spiritual reformation, cleansing of the heart. Right? The second area of concern and neglect, which we have noticed amongst the ulama of India and Pakistan, uh, is that after graduating, students are no longer concerned about going into the service of some uh, scholar or some alim or some muslim or some murabi uh, to correct themselves. Remember, an alim deprived of spiritual cleansing can never truly benefit the ummah. Neither shall he be able to benefit himself. Thus, here is a fundamental condition for an alim and it does not just come by merely reading books. Even if one were to memorize Kitab al rafaiq and Kitab al-Iman, etc., and the books of the Sawwuf, uh, one will never uh, then too, without the aid of a successful guide, one's tazkiyah will not be complete. When we have completed, when we completed our Dawratul Hadith, our Honorable Father began a course called the Khassus Fil Ifta. This was the first time that such a course was introduced in Pakistan and India. Together with my beloved uh, brother, Mufti Taqi Uthmani, we totaled about six or seven during that year. After this, other madaris followed suit. This, uh, the course began with a one-year syllabus, and then it was increased to two years, and now presently in Darul Ulum Karachi, it is a three-year syllabus. Without Tazkiyah, one's deen remains incomplete. During those days, our honorable father would regularly say to us, you have studied fiqh of Zahir. You now need to pay attention to the Ba'afi matters. Jayid. Without spiritual cleansing, salvation is not attained. If your internal is not corrected, your external actions will also be affected and they shall be bereft of any barakah. He would, he would also say, Maulana Abdul Ghani Palin Puri is still alive. Dr. Abdul Hay Sahib Arifi is still alive. They are from amongst the great khulafa of Maulana Ashraf Ali Tanvi. And uh, since we four brothers and I found our affiliation to our father to be the strongest, we would repeatedly request that our father accept our allegiance. However, he would refuse. In 1966, when I accompanied my father on his visit to South Africa, we spent some time in Krugersdorp. Despite the severe cold, our programs and activities would continue late in the night, at times even up to 11 and 12 o'clock at night. One night, however, I found some free time with my father and I went again and repeated my request. On this occasion, he replied, listen, there are two aspects. One is reformation and the other is allegiance. Reformation is for the aim. This should not be delayed. Thus I advise you, uh, thus I shall advise you with some wadaif, which uh, you should begin immediately. As for pledging allegiance, although at times children have pledged allegiance to their father and benefited, but both the father and the child have to, in this case, be extremely cautious. The relationship between a father and the son is one of informality. Whereas formality is informality is detrimental for the murid, for the disciple. <clears throat> I fear that I shall not be able to practice upon the correct, <coughs> proper caution, which is demanded, etc., etc. And then he continues. 
also he says to his uh, sons that uh, this one sheikh uh, who was not a uh, alim etc but he was a very spiritual person he says also it's a benefit if you'll go to him and learn about tazkiya etc from him why because you'll, you'll think you're like alim now mashallah your heads are big at least if you go to him then you will humble yourself before him so that covers up to page number 23 the rest of the book i'm just going to do a summary now inshallah because of uh, time uh, he also mentions here when you are still not matured you are still not ready when you shall mature none shall be able to restrict you i fear that uh, allah forbid if the desire of fame enters your heart all your efforts will be rendered useless thus for the moment do not go around delivering lectures at the time i was 41 years of age <coughs> subhanallah his father said he was 41 years of old age father is still saying you don't go and deliver lectures etc et you still keep studying and all of this here at the time i was 41 years of age and i was a father of four children i was the principal of Darul ulum karachi and i was teaching muslim sharif in the Darul ulum yet my father would not allow me to go in public and deliver lectures subhanallah Jai, why because i'm worried that you will become famous and the fame will get to your head Allah time a long time eventually when he did do a lecture etc was told uh, to make dua before the lecture oh Allah, let me say what is correct in the correct method and with the correct intention before setting out on the journey perform two rakas and recite so and so dua on the journey uh, look at the you know how careful he's going to deliver deliver his lecture then so make two rakas before you go and deliver the lecture and then make dua that oh Allah, let me see what is correct and the correct method with the correct intention he then said remember do not give flowery lectures and do not speak to thrill the audience wherever you go look at the problems of the area and present the remedy apply balm where there is a wound so that was the first one was tabahur with regards to knowledge seek more knowledge second one was tazki of the nafs and now the third one and this is uh, having adab al khilaf uh, deferring the third aspect that i want to bring to your attention difference of opinion in religious aspects where there is no clear cut qat'i evidence uh, will always occur <coughs> Those masail which have no distinct law are known as the uh, the, 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 the masail of ijtihad. Right? And such differences, we must not condemn those differences. Differences not uh, occurring in masail which have no nas qat'i could only be possible due to two reasons. Everyone's level of understanding is on a different level. Right? Uh, and number two, they are intelligent ulama present who are well capable of making research, but due to their consideration for the feelings of others or just to please others, they hypocritically remain quiet, despite the fact that their research has led them to a different conclusion. Similarly, due to friendship, family relationship, or many other factors, one conceals one's knowledge. Difference of opinion is a mercy, and division, division, division is punishment. We can defer, but we don't need to divide. It says that so many examples of minute masail and people, ulama, are fighting. He said between Imam Abu Hanifa and his students, there were many differences of opinion, etc., etc. Right? About two thirds of the Hanafi madhab, the students of Imam Abu Hanifa, they deferred with the Imam, but it didn't mean that they divided. He says that if you if your spiritual rectification, if your inside is correct, then you will not divide. But because we are messed up inside, that's why we divide quickly. <clears throat> you mentioned some incident here that uh, <clears throat> it says here that uh, today there's so much of differences and fighting, etc., etc., and the sole reason being that the people of the past, they had external and internal ulum uh, zahir and ulum batin. Whereas today we are only about the zahir and we forgot about the batin. Right? Allah Difference of opinion together with love and respect. Jayid. It says sometimes <coughs> other ulama bring to our attention 
some mistake that we make, etc. They even bring evidences. Then too, we are still not prepared to sit down and coolly ponder over it. Forget ever retracting. And the people of the past were not like that. He said, even today, people are so stubborn, even if they are proven to be wrong, they still won't retract. He says, it all boils down to one thing. Our spiritual rectification has not been made. When the heart is not clean, other maladies automatically become apparent. Self-conceit and pride takes one's opinion, takes over one's opinion, uh, and all of this stems from the root of the heart not being clean. Oh, I'm sorry. So then he says, at the end of it, in summary, number one, don't stop seeking knowledge and seek depth in your knowledge. Number two, don't forget about this here and the matter of the batin. And number three, differences of opinion should not allow us to be divided amongst ourselves. Very simple, easy, profound, important book, Jayid, if only but. We live up to those advices. Allahu Musta'an. Until we meet again, Ya Mashaykh, Barakallahu Fikum. Hada, Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant khair and baraka to Mawlana Mufti Muhammad Rafi Uthmani. He is very ill at the moment. We visited him about two or three years ago in Pakistan. Allah grant him shifa. And uh, Allah grant us all khair and barakah. Hayyakum Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.